December 29th, 1980. Dayton, Texas. Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and seven-year-old Colby Landrum were driving home on the winding roads of State Road 1485, going back home to Dayton, Texas, after dinner on one fateful night. What normally would be a drive that is not out of the ordinary, the three would encounter something truly out of this world. While driving, they witnessed an extremely bright light descend towards their vehicle. When they stopped to see what this object was, they noticed a diamond-shaped object that put off immense heat. They felt their faces burning, and out of nowhere, they observed numerous helicopters appear in the night sky, and they began following the object. They hopped back in their car and sped off. Now, what would transpire after would be known as one of the most infamous and shadowy encounters with UFOs to date. What is responsible for the plethora of health conditions that caused the witnesses to fall ill? Was the government somehow involved? And why, over 40 years later, we still have no answers to what happened that night in East Texas? Today, on Unblurring the Unknown, the Cash Landrum Incident. Welcome back to Unblurring the Unknown. As always, I am your host, Dominic. And today's episode is back into the realm of aliens and UFOs. It has been quite a long stretch of time since I've done an episode on aliens, so I felt like it was only fitting if I come back to it and obviously continue to mix it up for you all each and every week. Now, today's topic on the surface might just seem like your average run-of-the-mill UFO story and that maybe it doesn't sound all that interesting. And that is where you would be wrong. Not only is this one of the more compelling and interesting cases I have heard about, there are a lot of moving pieces and unanswered questions to this day that have never been fully explained. So with that being said, how today's episode is going to work is that I'm going to go in-depth about the encounter Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and her grandson Colby Landrum had that night, the events and possible cover-up that ensued afterwards, the government's possible involvement with this story, and the possibilities that other people that night saw the same unexplainable object. Now, at the very end, we will recap and go over some personal thoughts of mine and theories about what truly could have happened that night. Now, our story starts with where it takes place, Dayton, Texas. Dayton is a small suburb with a population over just over 8,500 people. It's, it's almost right in the middle between Houston and Beaumont, Texas. Now, other than that, there aren't many things, from what I could find, that make Dayton necessarily noteworthy. Except, of course, it is a setting in which the Cash-Landrum incident would take place. On December 29th, 1980, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's grandson Colby were driving home after having dinner on State Road 1485 on the outskirts of Houston, not far from the International Airport, en route back home to Dayton. At around 9 p.m. that night is when Vicky would notice a very odd light in the sky. Vicky described her first sighting of the light with the following quote, You could see it through the trees. It started to get real close. Then I knew it wasn't a plane. Now, as they continued driving down the road, the light started getting closer and closer, and the outline and shape of the object began to come into view. The object was a massive diamond shaped, with what Cash and Landrum described, with flames shooting out the bottom tip of it. Betty Cash, who was driving, hit the brakes immediately as they were all shocked by what they were witnessing. Now this object, whatever it was, was emitting intense levels of heat. Heat so hot, it was making the inside and outside of Cash and Landrum's car hot to the touch. Betty described the following instance with this quote. We didn't know what it was, but we knew there was something that was lighting up the sky. We had begun to feel heat and all of a sudden Vicky screamed for me to stop. And when I stopped, she went forward, and her handprint was embedded into the dash of the car. And I thought, well, I've got to see what this is. So I got out, walked towards the front of the automobile, and I stood there looking up to try and figure out what this object was. It was a diamond-shaped object. Down at the bottom, flames were shooting out. The heat was tremendous. It just felt like I was burning from the inside out. When I reached for the car door handle, the door handle was so hot, I couldn't even begin to hold on to it. I was more than scared. The only thing I was thinking was, are we going to get out of here alive? End quote. Now, during the initial sighting, Colby, who was seven at the time of this incident, 
was extremely distraught. Now, Vicky was very religious, and she was Christian, and she told Colby not to be afraid of the object, as she was quoted as claiming the object was, quote-unquote, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and, refer, and would refer to the object as Jesus to Colby. Now, it is uncertain whether she did this because she was genuinely believing that, that this was the second coming of Jesus Christ, or perhaps she was just saying this to keep Colby relaxed during the ordeal. That is not fully known, and I don't feel like that is ever fully explained by Vicky in any interviews that she did after the fact. Betty and Vicky exited their car to, of course, get a better look at this object or craft, and the heat continued to be so intense that they said it felt like their skin was being burnt from the heat the object radiated off. Now, of course, this includes the door handles, as I just mentioned, as the two women say that they were extremely hard to open, as they were so hot to the touch. Now, of course, in the quote I just cited from Betty, when the two women were in the car observing this object, Vicky had put her hand on the dash, and the car had supposedly gotten so hot to the point that the dash was slightly soft, and it melted, and when Vicky touched the dash, a handprint was left behind. Moments after this, the UFO started ascending from where it currently was, hovering just above the road approximately 130 feet from Betty and Vicky's car. When the object started to ascend, this is when other objects would appear, but not more UFOs, but rather helicopters. 23 Boeing CH-47 Chinook helicopters appeared from all around, seemingly following or giving chase to the object. Now, there seems to be conflicting reports on whether or not it was 22 or 23 helicopters, but from what I could find from multiple sources, they say 23, so that is what I'm going to go with in this instance. Now, Vicky described the helicopter as having double rotaries on them, which at the time would only leave the Chinook as the only double rotor helicopter in service, as the Osprey was not yet introduced and wouldn't be until 1988. Now, that might be a little bit unrelated, but that's just a little military knowledge for the next time you're playing trivia at your local bar. Now, Vicky thought and was quoted as saying that these Chinook helicopters must have belonged to the Army. Now, after all, that would be very reasonable to assume after all. Nobody just has 23 Chinook helicopters just lying around that they can take out whenever they want to. Now, while this is all going on, Betty, Vicky, and Colby sped away in their car trying to get away from the scene of the incident and just try and make it back home to Dayton. However, this is not where our story ends, in fact. It is just getting started. When the three of them returned home, they all felt incredibly ill. Colby woke up in the middle of the night and complained of nausea and actually had vomited in his bed. Now, at this point, Betty and Vicky were also not feeling well at all, and come morning, they felt extremely worse. Not only did the three of them feel extremely weak, but they also had diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, a burning sensation in their eyes, and very red and tender skin much like how it feels after you get a really, really bad sunburn. Now, Betty was in the worst shape out of the three, and suffered hair loss and the appearance of several red blisters formed on her skin. Now, on January 3rd, after Betty's condition steadily worsened, Vicky convinced her to go get treated for whatever this condition was, and she did seek treatment at a Houston area hospital. Betty sought the consultation of her personal physician, Dr. Brian McKelland, and what they came to for a conclusion is a very interesting one, but also very strange. It turns out what Dr. McClelland thought Betty had contracted was quote-unquote textbook radiation poisoning. Radiation poisoning? How is that possible? Is there some way that the heat radiating off this mystery object they witnessed just a week prior could have been unleashing unhealthy amounts of radiation? Could Betty, Vicky, and Colby have been exposed to a lethal amount? These are all questions that you're probably asking yourself, as they are very good questions to ask. Now, Betty underwent treatment for acute radiation poisoning, and ultimately spent a total of six weeks in the hospital for treatment. In an interview done with the Houston Post in 1991, Dr. McClelland told the newspaper that Betty's radiation poisoning was so bad, he compared that to what you would see in similar levels in people who were quote-unquote, and this is a quote from Dr. McClelland, from people who were three to five miles from the epicenter of Hiroshima. Now, which is true, you could argue, that maybe Betty Cash should be dead. If it was in fact that Betty was exposed to levels of radiation that were similar to people three to five miles from the epicenter of Hiroshima, 
That is ungodly amounts of radiation that probably nobody is regularly exposed to during a lifetime, let alone one specific instance. And it turns out that the health problems that Cash and the Landrums would suffer would linger with, with them throughout the rest of their lives. Betty would later in life go on to develop breast cancer and other types of cancer. And that has been assumed to be related to this incident that occurred that night and due to the radiation exposure. Dr. McClelland was quoted as saying, and I quote, There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Betty was exposed to high doses of radiation. As to what the source was, I can't exactly say. Now, Betty, Vicky, and Colby have suffered from adverse health conditions their entire lives, and Betty ultimately passed away in 1998, and Landrum would pass away in 2007, both still suffering long-term adverse health effects associated with the incident and radiation exposure. Now, because of Cash and Landrum's health conditions and the idea that perhaps there was something greater going on here, after all, what about the helicopters? Where did they come from? Was it possible that this was maybe not a UFO, but maybe the U.S. military was involved? Maybe the U.S. military was chasing this thing, and it didn't want the public to find out about it. Was this some type of experimental government crash that the Cash and Landrum saw that night that they weren't supposed to see? Betty and Vicky wanted answers as to what happened to them that night, and knew that the only way they were going to get it is if they went up to the highest authority that they could think of within the state of Texas, their state senators, Lloyd Benson and John Tower to be specific. Though, through this, they filed a complaint with the Judge Advocate Claims Office at the Bergstrom Air Force Base. They were actually both interviewed by the staff of Bergstrom Air Force Base and were advised to hire a lawyer as they started to seek financial compensation for their injuries as they started leaning towards the idea that the government was not telling them the full story of what was going on. And if I was in their shoes, I would think the same exact thing. The case ultimately made its way up all the way to the U.S. District Court judge, where it was ultimately dismissed in 1986, as the judge argued that Cash and Landrum had no way to prove that the craft they witnessed was property of the U.S. government, as the U.S. government did not have a craft that matched that description in its arsenal. Which, in my opinion, is kind of a bogus excuse, because, quite frankly, we learn about top-secret aircraft all the time. That, and especially when the U.S. suddenly declassifies this document and kind of says, oh, look at, look at this we made. And it turns out that this aircraft or technology has been in service for multiple decades, and we just barely found out about it because they've kept it a secret this entire time. Take the instance of the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, which was remained classified for numerous years during its development, and its entire project was handled with intense sneakiness for numerous years after it was first released and being used by the U.S. military. Now, of course, you could make this case for numerous other aircraft that have since been declassified from the U.S. military, but it begs the question, what do they have that they are hiding from us? And what Cash and Landrum witnessed that night, could this have been some sort of experimental technology that the U.S. military was testing out? And they just happened, in fact, to witness it that night on the road, and now the military is trying to cover up their mistake. It's a very good possibility, and it really makes you think. Now, shortly after this event, Betty and Vicky did seek help from another source to try and figure out what the object could have been that they witnessed that night. And who they reached out to was UFO investigator John Schusler, who had previously been a project manager for NASA. So on the surface, he seems like a guy who would be qualified to take on this type of investigation. Now, this is a quote from Schusler in regards to the event, and I quote, We had done several interviews with Betty and Vicky, and then we went out to the location where this happened. They were very clear on where it happened and how it happened. They told us exactly where along the road they stopped, because there were markers that identified the spot. They were able to point out exactly where they saw the object coming down out of the sky, over the road, and hovering there. They were able to point out a spot on the road that indicated that it had been heated to an extreme level of heating. It was burned, and it was very clear to the naked eye. Several weeks after we went out to the spot and saw this burned area, Someone dug up the road and hauled it away and replaced it with new asphalt. Some of the witnesses that watched this happen said people brought in unmarked trucks, dug up the road, put material on the trucks, covered it with a tarpaulin, and drove away. Schusler started on the ground and wanted to find out if anyone else that night had seen anything that could corroborate what Cash and Landrum had saw that night, and it turns out other people did. 
Schuessler started within a five-mile radius of the sighting that Cash and Landrum had, and it turns out there were more witnesses. Schuessler was also quoted as saying, At least ten other people had seen the object, and seven or eight other people had seen the helicopters, and their descriptions were all very similar to what Betty and Vicky described. One of the most notable of these sightings was actually from a police officer named L.L. Walker, who was in the area around the initial sighting from Cash and Landrum. This is what Walker said about his experience that night, and I quote, My wife Marie and I were returning from her mother and dad's. As we were coming out of some tree lines, I saw a helicopter. It was shining a spotlight at the ground. Then I heard the noise of other helicopters behind it, and I stopped the car, because I didn't know what was going on. The helicopters were military, and they were all flying fairly low to the ground, and all of them had search beams on. I thought maybe there was an airplane down, but they didn't hesitate. They kept going in the same direction, which would probably intersect the area where Vicky said her encounter was. So it was important to note that Walker didn't see the craft directly, but Schuessler said other witnesses did, along with the helicopters, which adds some credibility to this story. But ultimately, this story even though unproven to this day about what really happened, remains a landmark case in regards to UFO research and evidence, as this brought UFOs into the legal scene, as well as the introduction again of the U.S. military possibly being involved in some sort of UFO-related incident and possible cover-up. But with that all being said, let's kind of review all this information we discussed and go over some possible theories over what could have happened that night outside of Dayton, Texas. Now, I want to circle back to the quote that John Schuessler had that I just stated. Obviously, he just mentioned that unmarked trucks came and dug up the road, which implying that there is some type of cover-up going on, whether that be from the U.S. military or from some unknown group. Now, whether or not this craft that Betty Cash and Vicky Landrum observed was a UFO, or whether this was some kind of classified military project, still remains unknown. But the fact that the military was involved at all, and... Vicky and Betty said that they saw the helicopters, and L.L. Walker said that he saw the helicopters, and seven or eight other witnesses also said they saw the helicopters, including ten other witnesses that saw the craft itself. Now, in my research, I couldn't exactly find the other witnesses coming forward with their encounters. So that does beg the question, you know, the authenticity of it. Maybe they didn't want to come forward. Maybe they didn't want to come forward for a risk of scrutiny. There's a lot of other factors at play when you start to talk about UFOs and UFO sightings. A lot of people are very hesitant to share their stories for fear of ridicule or just fear of people just not even believing them. So I do want to throw that out there. If somebody, in fact, did find some of these other sightings um, in their own personal research or just kind of in their own scouring of the internet, please send them along to me um, as I was not able to find them. And I would greatly appreciate the help if you were able to find those. But with that being said, let's get into some of these theories, and then I'll also discuss my own personal thoughts as well. Now, our first theory is that this encounter was real, and what Betty, Vicky, and Colby witnessed was in fact a UFO, and this would be a worthy contender for my personal theory. However, some questions still remain unanswered. Now, we do have photographic evidence of the blisters that Betty received after the incident. However, we don't have the photographic evidence of the hand impression that Vicky left in the dashboard of the car during the encounter. Now, if we did, that would seemingly be a smoking gun, as that would imply that the car was exposed to immense heat. Now, testing the car for radiation wouldn't be as much of a convincing factor, as radiation doesn't stick to vehicles the way it sticks and kind of makes its way into the human body. Obviously, radiation stays in the human body for a much longer period of time than it sticks on objects. So that wouldn't really be able to be tested if you're kind of thinking that way, like, oh, why don't they test the car for radiation? It doesn't fully work that way, unfortunately. If it did, again, that would be another piece of evidence that we could use and say that this event actually happened. UFO or not, I guess that's up for discussion, but you could at least say that they did su- they did see something at night, or at least were exposed to very high levels of radiation. However, the dashboard is our premier evidence, and we don't have it. However... Betty, Vicky, and Colby did get sick, and I guess you can use that to defend the claim that they were exposed to extremely high levels of radiation from this unknown unknown object. However, from what I could find, Vicky and Colby didn't get treatment for their illnesses, or at least what I could find. Again, that could be disputed, and the sources I found didn't say whether or not Vicky and Colby got treated for 
Um, however, it would really make me believe this whole thing more. And I'm not saying that I'm a skeptic about this whole incident. But if Vicky and Colby got tested as well and they also had radiation poisoning, that would make me believe this so much more. Because, you know, I think maybe you could make the argument that they did witness something that night, but Betty is the only one that's confirmed to get radiation poisoning. And I guess she got the closest to the object, so that would make sense. But any skeptic would look at this and say, oh, well, Betty has radiation poisoning and you two didn't get tested, so there's no way to prove that you all three were there that night and that you all three saw this. Or maybe that Betty got exposed to something before the fact, and you were just making this story up. Skepticists can go a lot of different directions with this, and I like to lay everything out in the best possible way I can. Approach it from a neutral angle, and then kind of tell you what I think about it, obviously. Um, but I wish Vicky and Colby also got tested, because it would add a lot more insight to the event if they also had radiation poisoning. And I couldn't find a definitive answer on that. But I just, I did want to throw that out there and clarify that as well. Now, you can use that, that they did get sick. You can use that to defend the claim that they were exposed to extremely high levels of radiation from this kind of unknown object. However, is this a UFO? Is this aliens or is this something else? Now, our second theory is that this is real, but rather this was the government. Now, this theory, I want to lean more with just the idea that this sighting of the helicopters also goes with this story, and perhaps the government was testing out some sort of classified vessel, or perhaps it got lost in some way and they were trying to track it down. This would explain the irradiation, or at least, I think so. Maybe perhaps the fire and the radiation were how this craft powered itself. Maybe perhaps the military was experimenting with nuclear-powered technology, and this is how this craft powered itself, and this is how it would you know, traverse the area, and this is the, that's the reason for the fire, is because it's, it is discharging nuclear energy, and that's why there's a fire. Maybe this is a stretch, but I don't necessarily think it's a big one. Once Betty, Vicky, and Colby came into contact with this vessel, obviously the military went into full cover-up mode, and they just went and tried to get compensation, and the military obviously played coy with, with uh, Cash and the Landrums and said, okay, this object doesn't exist, and that's why you can't sue us, because this object doesn't exist, there's no way you can sue us, and just, like, you can, you can go through all the avenues you want, but we're just going to say this just doesn't exist, and that's what we're going to go with, and you're just going to look like you're crazy. Now, of course, this wouldn't be the first time that we've seen the military try and cover up a UFO-related incident. I feel like every year we find something that's a little bit shady in regards to the UFO covering things up. And it's certainly not the first time on this podcast that we've covered something that the military has deliberately tried to cover up from the public or cover up from victims of a certain event. Now, the interview conducted by the staff at Bergstrom Air Force Base was probably precautionary. And that was probably to make sure that Betty, Vicky, and Colby weren't suspicious of a military cover-up. They brought him in and said, hey, we'll interview you, but we kind of know the story. We're covering this shit up. But for precautionary, we'll ask you all these questions. We'll look like we're interested when in reality we're not. We don't care. We're covering this up. So that I want to lean towards more in my personal theory. Um, but that's just for right now because I have one more theory left for you. Now, our last series that this was a hoax, and this would entail, of course, that this was some type of fake encounter, and that the object they saw didn't actually exist. Perhaps there were indeed helicopters flying around that night, and they decided to fake some type of story for maybe fame or financial reasons, and maybe once they got sick with some type of unknown illness, they decided to make up a story and try and get some money from the government. Now, on the surface, I don't know if I'm buying this one, because they had radiation poisoning, or at least Betty did. And Betty later developed cancer, so they were exposed to something, although the claim about the handprint and the dash would hold more validity if that photo existed. However, it doesn't, which kind of brings you into that kind of limbo stage of, you know, they got sick. That's evidence. They did get sick from radiation poisoning, or at least Betty did, from what I could find in, in my research. So she encountered something that had extremely high levels of radiation. That's confirmed. That's factual information. However, the claim about the, hot, the car being so hot that Vicky's hand actually imprinted in the dash, we have no way to prove because that photo doesn't exist. Now, which, if you're a skeptic, makes you think that maybe they did make the story up after maybe getting sick from some unknown cause, 
and then maybe they decided to try and get some money out of it. Now, this does, of course, seem a little far-fetched, but I don't think the story itself is entirely fake, but I wouldn't be shocked if there were certain aspects of it that were embellished once Cash and Landrum knew that they could get some type of financial compensation from their injuries from the encounter. Again, that is just my own personal opinion on the matter, but I feel like whenever whenever money or finances starts to play a role in UFO encounters, it always calls everything that happened into question. When somebody has an encounter and they witness something and they just say, you know, I'm going to go public with my story. I'm not in this for money. I need, just need to tell people what happened and make them aware of my story. It makes it a heck of a lot more reasonable to assume what actually happened was real rather than saying, hey, we're trying to get financial compensation for our injuries, regardless or not, whether or not you did get hurt and whether you were entitled to financial compensation, which I believe in this fact they were, it doesn't matter. Skeptics are still going to look at that and be like, oh, well, they're trying to get money from the government, which again, if you're a skeptic, I can see why you would go with this. Now, my personal thoughts on the matter is that perhaps this is a little bit of both. I think Cash and the Landrums genuinely saw something that night. And when they caught an illness from something, they decided to try and get financial compensation out of it. Now, if they didn't get sick from this object, would they have still tried to use the story as some sort of way to gain financial compensation in some way? That remains unknown, as that just didn't happen. Now, like I just mentioned, whenever money plays an impact in these stories, things kind of always get called into question. And if maybe if Betty didn't get super duper sick like she did, maybe the financial compensation wouldn't have been brought up. And maybe this story from a skeptic's point of view would be a lot more believable. Now, on the matter of fact, on whether or not this was a UFO or a government experiment, I'm more willing to wager that maybe this was a government experiment and not a UFO. Now, the reason I think that way is that the fire at the bottom of the diamond-shaped object sticks out to me. Because fire is not possible in space because there is no oxygen. So, why was the object emitting the fire? The fire would only make sense if this was in fact a testing vessel used by the U.S. government that ran on nuclear energy and the fire was just the exhaust port for expelling this nuclear fuel. To me, that part sticks out just quite a bit. Now, it would also be nice if L.L. Walker, the police officer who witnessed the helicopters, also witnessed the object, because then it would have added another layer of credibility that perhaps the military has a vehicle or craft such as this one that they just happen to be testing, or perhaps maybe someone even stole it and took it on a test drive, but who knows? That is just my personal opinion. However, unfortunately, we might never know if a craft like this actually exists, as that might remain hidden in a government file for the foreseeable future. However, of course, that is my just my personal opinion on the matter. If you have your own personal opinion, please leave it in the comment section. Feel free to email me on all that. I appreciate you here. I appreciate hearing all your opinions, your thoughts, your comments, everything like that. I greatly appreciate it. And of course, I, it gets me involved. I love researching these things, especially UFOs. They're always cool whenever I research them. Um, so if you have your own personal thoughts and theories, please share them with me. But with that being said, if you are listening to this episode on Spotify, please feel free to turn on post notifications so you get notified every time I post a new episode. Now, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe. It helps me out with the algorithm gods, and I greatly appreciate it. Now, if you are also not aware, I am officially on TikTok. That is Unblurring the Unknown on TikTok, where I post one-minute breakdowns of the episodes that I do, trying to get a little bit more engagement, trying to reach out to a little broader scope of an audience that also appreciates these topics like I do. Now, as well, you can also send me topic suggestions to my email. That is unblurringtheunknown at gmail.com. I'll say that again, unblurringtheunknown at gmail.com. You can send those topic suggestions to me right there, and I will add them to the queue, and I will try and get to them as soon as I possibly can. Make sure you also follow me on Instagram, also unblurringtheunknown, as I will be posting custom cover art and photos that I find relevant to this week's episode on there as well. But with that being said, that is going to conclude this week's episode of Unblurring the Unknown. I hope you all enjoyed it. Have a couple more episodes lined up in the coming weeks. Um, trying to, again, 
keep it as interesting, keep it as random as possibly can. So you never know what I'm going to cover next week. And that's the whole point. I try and keep it as spontaneous and random as I can. So you never know what I'm going to do. Um, I got a lot of true crime topics in my queue right now. I'm trying to break them up as much as possible because I feel like I've done quite a few episodes on that recently. Um, however, if you want to listen to more true crime from me, um, I feel like those are actually my episodes that are getting the most engagement right now. Um, let me know if you want to hear more true crime or you want to hear more UFOs or you want to hear more cryptids. Just let me know. I would, I'm more than willing to try and oblige the best I can. Um, but with that being said, that will conclude this week's episode. I hope you all enjoyed it and I will see you all on the next one. 